So, how do we feel? Are we energized for the second session? Excitement in the air, I can feel. <laughs> yeah, after lunch, people get a bit sleepy. So let's hope that the business and growth session, which is the topic of uh, this part of the day, will energize us. And um, Yes, uh, thank you. I think it definitely will, uh, because as we talked before, uh, creative thinking and crossovers are very much uh, linked uh, with economic performance, and so business is vitally crucial in this aspect. And so for the first speaker, I want you to give a round of applause to uh, Jose Tavares. Uh, he's a professor of economics at the Nova School of Business and Economics in Lisbon. Uh, and he will speak about the language of culture and economics, how it relates, and uh, more about himself and the work he does. So the floor is yours. So good afternoon. So uh, talking after lunch and uh, uh, referring to economics is certainly a challenge because many people will have an internal reject immediate rejection to this. So I want to start with a personal story. When I started talking in the conferences about culture and economics, I was very worried because people talked about the economists as always. They talked about these wonderful people that are, that are out of the box. And then there were economists that are dangerous people but very uncreative people. So there were these two types of people. At one point, someone said to me, you are an out of the box economist. So I was very happy. I went to my university and I told this story to another professor and he said, oh no, it's not good. You're stuck now. You will be out of the box forever. You cannot be creative again. So you, what I want to say is these two disciplines, these two fields, economics and, um, and culture, speak different languages, but they are not necessarily worried about different things. And there's a lot that can be learned if we start translating uh, the languages better. Because we as human beings are worried about basically the same things. So let me start with this. Detroit is a city that many of you have heard about in the US. And Detroit has two claims to fame, actually three, but I'm gonna talk about two now, which is one, the car, a car city uh, the car capital of the world. So you can see that the tourist poster with smokestacks on the right, Detroit City, uh, Rough River coastline, this type of tourist poster which, with chimneys is very specific and shows really a pride in being an industrial uh, powerhouse. But then Detroit is also the city of Motown, one of the most influential uh, record labels in soul music and uh, African-American music in general. But interesting, interestingly, the label is called Motown, from Motor Town, and, uh, and so everything was intertwined. This city was incred seemed incredibly well integrated in terms of industry powerhouse and also a cultural uh, dynamo, at least for pop culture. For those that have not read the news in the past five years or 10 years, Detroit is also a case, a unique case, of a city that had three million people at some point and now has less than one million people. It's a case of ultimate decay. There's basically not many examples in history where a city is that large and then shrinks to, the, to this, to this uh, size. And the economist ran something on the story of Detroit and the population, so you can see it here. Uh, actually uh, around two million was the peak, but you see that it started with industry, you have Motown records in 1959, and it, then you have a lot of crises, the oil crisis that affected car in, the car industry, but you had race riots, it became known as the murder capital of the US, and it's amazing that a city that was able to integrate actually two important ethnic groups in the US. So you had African Americans going from the south to the north for high wages in the car industry. And there were these same African Americans, sometimes and at, at first mostly men and mostly lone men, that brought the music with them, brought the blues, brought the soul, brought 
a lot of this stuff. So this was very well integrated and suddenly fell apart as a, as a system, as a city, in part because the cultural integration between ethnic groups completely broke down. And now it's a laboratory for many social experiments, but not an, any experiment in prosperity. So if you want to, if you want to go back to Pierluigi Sacco's uh, framework, where uh, Pierluigi sets up a culture 1.0, culture 2.0, and culture 3.0 stages, with several different individuals or actors having different roles, for instance, the wealthy and the powerful was, were key for culture 1.0 of patronage. Uh, they were uh, losing importance as time goes by in culture 2.0, but are still relevant today. We maybe don't like to admit it, but the wealthy and the powerful are very important uh, in terms of their relation to culture. Well, we can interpret maybe boldly that Detroit was very well in terms of culture 2.0, industry, mass production, the, the association with mass means of communication, producing records, but did not make the leap at all to culture 3.0, where the connection between economics or the economy and culture is much more complex, much more organic, and, and, uh, and so not so vulnerable as was the case in, in Detroit. So let me talk about these two languages, economics and um, actually before. If you want to think of uh, Pierluigi Sacco's uh, framework, you can also think about this thing that we all have in mind, that we come from agriculture, industry, services, and actually services is already very intensive in terms of culture, in terms of interchange, it's less mechanical, less engineering like than industry. But then you, you, you start hearing now, you start hearing a few decades ago about knowledge economy, and now about things like the experience economy. So you give different values to things depending on, uh, depending on the way you perceive them. And for any, anyone that doubts that this is a, a major uh, driver of human nature, you have to think about this, just think about the selfies and how it became in two or three years a major epidemic because people want to transmit experience and actually confirm their own experience. I was there. I, I saw, they want to, sh to tell their friends, I was there. I saw this wonderful picture of the Brazilian president with uh, uh, manual workers, so construction workers in Brazil. And uh, so they were next to the president, eight of them, and they were not looking at her or the camera. They were taking selfies. Six of them were taking selfies with, with the president. So they didn't even care about the president itself. They wanted to show someone that they were with the president. So the experience economy, it goes to the core of something that is very valuable to us. So economics as a, as a, or the economy as a major problem or a major starting point that people sometimes take for the whole picture. The economy and economics starts from the individual. And the individual is very, very much not not, really, not akin to what we call culture. Culture is about different people, people communicating, communicating differently, perceiving things differently. So if you have a science that starts from the individual and values the individual, uh, you have a, maybe a, a communication problem. Another thing that is different between the, uh, eco the economy and, and the cultural realms is that in, a, in the economy you can you have a lot of exchanges, so actual exchanges, I give you this and you give me that, and usually you have prices. And this is something that you don't like to see, we don't like to see in culture. We don't really like to have this mercantilistic uh, approach that we are offering this to other person and or to other groups and they are offering us this and for a price. We don't like that. So these, these are, this is a bad starting point. Another difference between economics and uh, culture is the perception of value. So economics knows very well that what we care about is not money. If you hear economists telling, an economist telling you people care about money, I can assure you it's a bad economist. 
money is just a means, but it's a, such a powerful mean in the sense that it, it is measurable, it's observable, that sometimes people think that what people care about is money. No, they care about something else. It can be power, prestige, can be a, high, a large TV screen, but it's something else. Money is instrumental. But this confusion is very easy to make. Uh, culture, on the other hand, the value of culture, we don't want to start by saying what was the price you exchanged this piece for, how much did you get, as a first guess at the ultimate value of a cultural uh, phenomenon or a cultural piece. So this is, these are different languages. Time. Uh, if you think about resources, eventually you come to think about time. For instance, investment. What is investment? We want to sacrifice something today, we want to eat less apples today, to have something more in the future. So this is about time. Yet, there is this perception that a lot of the value of culture, of cultural objects, uh, is not appropriately uh, assessed in the short run or in the, middle run, in the, in the mid run. Uh, think about, uh, this is a very standard example, Van Gogh, which sold ap apparently only one painting while he was alive. Of course, the value of his work cannot, w cannot be assessed by his contemporaries. So this is also a, a very big difference between the economy and culture. Culture produces value that will be relevant for people generations after we are there. If we produce apples and oranges, in themselves, they will be valuable mostly for those that eat them. So it's very different standards of time. Another difference between economics, economy and culture is uh, how you understand the collective. Again, there are tools in economics to think about collective goods, public goods, and these are important goods. Things that you have to do together or you don't do them as well. So this is in economics. But whereas in economics this sometimes is disguised because you're focusing on the individual and maybe how the individual gets from the collective, what he or she gets from the collective, in culture we're almost always thinking about the collective. When we, we say that this is a great work of art, we usually are not saying it's a great work of art for me or for this group. We are, say, we are having some kind of absolute standard. This is for a collective that actually is, again, as I told you, is not even alive. It's several generations in, in the making. So understanding the collective also brings noise to the relation. Preferences and uh, immaterial. Most of us believe that there are immaterial things there. I think most of us, luckily, because there are. And those are very valuable things. So as I told you, Economics thinks about preferences, what, people, what gives joy to people or satisfaction, and these are mostly immaterial stuff. But the immaterial is very hard to, to measure, so again, you tend to assess it through observation of exchanges and prices. Whereas culture is basically about the immaterial. If you think about uh, contemporary culture, uh, like video art, etc. Um, a lot of the value in this contemporary culture has to do, sometimes a piece is completely banal, no interest at all, vulgar or, or, or common, but the title or the context makes it incredibly valuable in the sense that it gives meaning and multiple meanings to people. So you have a culture with this dealing with multiple meanings and then you have economics and the economy that tends to restrict the, the speech to, to quantifiable stuff. Another thing that uh, is different is how you think, you, how you acknowledge the other. So you can think of, of the economy as thinking of very multiple, very, very, a multiple of needs. So people are basically the same, they are driven by the same stuff, and they are not, uh, we, you are not very focused on what makes people different. Well, whereas uh, culture is precisely about understanding the difference in others and also the difference in ourselves. So the other 
is, 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 is very important in culture, is very key, and the other may be ourselves in the making, whereas in economics, the other is very stylized, very, very simple. Uh, so this is, this is another, another, another fact. Finally, something that is a very bad word in economics, which is disequilibria, uh, non-equilibria, out of balance. Things are changing dramatically, are, are, are going into a new paradigm. This in economics is not, in the economy, is not the state you want to be in generally, or that you long for. For instance, the, actual, the present, present crisis in Europe can be seen as a disequilibrium. And we are unhappy about this. Where are we going to be? Is it that we have been doing things wrong and that's why we are in this mess, quote unquote? But disequilibrium is a bad thing in the economy in general. We want an equilibrium, smooth things, lots of oranges and apples being produced. Where is culture? Precisely because it's new, it's creative, it's disruptive, it's about the others, the other. Culture is a lot about this equilibrium in the sense of bringing you to new ideas, new uh, worlds, to see things that are there in a different light. So again, a shock between the two languages. So basically, you, you have gone, even in economics, you have gone from the individual to the individual with a lot of considerations that are complex, are difficult to, to, to assess, to consider, but they are there. And, and, and if we talk about economics only as, as caring about the individual, as an individualistic uh, science, we are losing a lot of the picture. So there's room for uh, communication. Let me tell you the following. So I actually passed this one. If you want to think of culture and uh, outcomes of culture, so, material, so economic or if you want welfare outcomes of culture, you can think of culture in, in basically three, three ways, and this is the way I have surveyed it in economics literature. You can think of culture as beliefs, values, norms, assumptions, emotions, very abstract things that people don't, are not even conscious of. Then you can have the second column where you think of attitudes and behavior. So you have certain values and you can have a certain attitude corresponding to this value. For instance, some cultures value the future a lot or security a lot and they save a lot. Uh, the value of security is, is in the first column. The value of saving a lot, like Chinese and like Asians in, in general do, is in the second row. And that's also called culture in, this, in these studies. But finally, you have a more narrow thing that sometimes is discussed in this conference, which is cultural activities. It can be cultural industries, can be uh, creation can be art, but the cultural activities, things that you do because of their cultural content. These are more and more observable. You cannot observe values very easily. You can observe cultural activities more easily. You paint a painting, you write a book. On the other hand, on the, the, the side of outcomes, you have the material, the direct, the private, the individual on one, one hand, which is very, are very measurable, so the second row from the, from the right, but you also have outcomes that are immaterial, indirect, public, collective, social, non-market. And you have now tools to measure this. And you have a lot of important tools. I'm not a fanatical for tools. It's not my main business. But there are tools, for instance, to evaluate, let's say you have a, a pair of very rare birds in a region. There are now tools to, to, to ask people that are directly affected by whether that pair of birds is going to stay there or you want to build a dam, uh, an hydroelectric dam, and you can evaluate how much this is valuable for people in terms not of money but of preferences. So if you can do this for a pair of birds that people don't know anything about, they just know that they are rare, they are there, they are not anywhere, you can do this for culture. So the instruments are already there, the, but, but the cultural players are not aware that there are these instruments. Usually questionnaires, qualitative questionnaires, very sophisticated ways to ask people what they are willing to sacrifice or not for certain cultural goods. Do I have one minute? That is interesting. So I'm going to pass this and I'm going to go to the, to the last slide, which is this one. In, during a study I did for the Portuguese government on the, precisely how culture, 
culture and economics can work together rather than uh, in parallel non-communicating uh, ways, I met with, uh, with uh, policymakers, cultural, cultural activists, and in one of the meetings, I asked them to say if they agree or not to each, to each of these quotations, the quotations on the second column. And I didn't tell them who had said that. I only revealed that afterwards. So you have a lot, these were quotations that had to do with culture and economics. So for instance, time. Camus said, any true creation is a gift to the future. And 74% uh, of the persons involved said yes, and they didn't know it was Camus. So it's a very consensual uh, thing. Toffler said, the law of raspberry jam, the wider any culture is spread, the thinner it gets, the, su the more superficial. 83%. 83% disagreed with this. So you go down this, and you have things like Jack Wealth. 87% of cultural activists agreed with Jack Wealth. Culture drives great results. So there's room for, for people to talk to each other. If you have cultural activists who agreeing with Jack Wealth, which is a, a, a not very sophisticated CEO of a car company, you, you have room to talk. Mahatma Gandhi, and uh, interestingly, 63% agreed with a quotation that was from Mao Zedong that said that um, letting 100 flowers blossom and 100 schools of thought content is the policy for promoting the progress of the arts and the science and the flourishing culture. So it's this very rare statement where Mao Zedong says that competition is good for culture. But it's there. And people agreed with it. And interestingly, 57% disagreed with the very pessimistic view by Milan Kundera Culture is perishing in overproduction, in an avalanche of, of words, in the madness of quantity. A lot of people think like this. Culture is being submerged by production, by material stuff. Kundera said this. Most of the cultural activists disagreed. And even Yoko Ono. Money became the running theme in every country and culture was sacrificed. It's, it's interesting. But most people disagree too, 56%. Anyway, what I want to finish with is the following. We are very creative people, whether we are economists, sociologists, cultural uh, policy makers, and certainly this is really good evidence that we are creative because we are still capable, after all these years, of agreeing with Mao Zedong and not in disagreeing with Milan Kundera. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. Anyone? Excited crowd. So I have a question. Uh, can you pass the mic? So. Are you one <laughs> So, you're from Pro Portugal, right? Yes. So you were hit by crisis pretty hard, right? So how you see economy and um, and uh, creativity and culture coming together now, the changes in culture with an attitude. Because uh, Northern people were, have shown, have told uh, South, Southern uh, Europeans, like, you have to change the approach. And that, that involves culture. So what's your take on that? Well, uh, let me tell you, if you drive in Lisbon these days, you have a, a political poster by a left-wing party written in German in German with the subtitles in the saying it's a, apparently some, something that Merkel said which, which was uh, Portuguese government is more German than the German government and I don't take this necessarily as a compliment but this is just to tell you that some people call us the Germans of the South in the sense that we if we have something to do okay it's a lot of pain but probably we'll do it and, and it, it, it will do it in a more how do you say, a non-chaotic way than some other southern countries. But I don't take this necessarily as a compliment. I think the crisis has changed some things. So for instance, people have become much more aware of the, the, the problems of the political system, the problems of spending too much driven by the political system. So there, was, there is a, a change, a cultural change in that respect. But it's also interesting that one of the few sectors that is doing very well in Portugal, growing at 10, 10, 12 percent a year is tourism. And if it was five or six years ago, because Lisbon and Oporto were relatively inexpensive 
compared with, with, with uh, other European capitals. Now it's clearly not that. Now you have TV stations going to interview, uh, I don't know, Chinese tur tourists and asking them about this or this, this, this cake, Portuguese cake, that is very well known, Portuguese custard pie. And the Chinese tourists say, oh no, I knew this before from China. So it's, it's, it's really, the, the niche has, has, has been found in some way. And it's always connected with the, the heritage and the culture of the country. So we are selling even uns, unsellable things like fado, which I like a lot, but I think it's basically unsellable. But we are being able to sell it. And, and so I, I think in a, in a sense the crisis was a wake-up call in some, se in some sense. I, I wish we would have been more rebellious in some areas, but that's our nature. But it was also a, a call to value the ways in which are, we are different from other Europeans and other, other countries and valuing it in a way that we can, um, how do you say, take tourism and, uh, and give a meaningful experience to these, to these visitors. Thank you so much, Jose. Uh, once we've established the link between culture and economics, we're going to move forward uh, with business prospects and uh, creating partnerships uh, with creative partners. And uh, it's my very dear pleasure to invite uh, Rasmus Winstead Churning, uh, the managing director of Center for Cultural and Experience Economy and the founder of Creative Business Cup, uh, which we witnessed uh, today as well. Uh, Rasmus, the floor is yours. Thank you, Liva, and thank you to the Latvian Presidency for inviting me here today. I am, um, as you mentioned, uh, the founder of uh, CBC, the Creative Business Cup. I also had the pleasure of being chairman of the European Creative Industries Alliance, ECIA, that I will briefly touch upon. I chair, together uh, with uh, Kimo, the, the OMC Group on Access to Finance, which is, we've also heard, is one of the big challenges for the culture and creative industries, access to finance. And um, I would like to speak about some of the experiences we've had in Denmark and in Europe on uh, this connection between uh, cultural entrepreneurship and innovation. And I will start up with my first slide. Here you see Lego architecture. And you uh, think probably that Lego would be one of the most creative uh, companies in the world. They have surpassed Mattel now and is the biggest uh, toy company in the world. They actually uh, were approached by an architect a couple of years ago saying, why don't you make a series called Lego Architecture? And Lego didn't really believe in that. Uh, they didn't believe that they could have a product for adults. Uh, so they uh, gave this architect uh, some bricks so he could start his own series of uh, Lego Architecture and he started producing and selling Lego Architecture. And then suddenly Lego discovered that he became uh, more and more wealthy, a bigger car, uh, et cetera, as the year went by. And Lego decided to buy back the brand uh, Lego Architecture, which is now one of the most important business lines. So even a creative company can need the input from other creatives to create business. Also, they revealed to me, Lego, that last year the most uh, profitable product line was not something their own creatives invented, Lego Ghostbusters. Lego Ghostbusters was the most, most selling product line, but it wasn't a suggestion by one of their own uh, creatives. It came from outside. They hadn't thought that a 20 or 30 year old movie would actually be uh, relevant today. Um, I'm glad that uh, the discussions we have had over the years on creative culture and creative industries have moved from what do we mean by uh, culture and creative industries instead of uh, what can they do for society. And I also think the more we look at uh, uh, culture and creative industries as um, a motor for innovation, it becomes more and more difficult to actually tell whether a company is in the creative industries or somewhere else. Uh, because as the previous speaker pointed out, the experience, is, experience economy is here. We're part of that and people are buying experiences. So uh, it, uh, it, it's, you might think that something is in the creative industries, but it is actually elsewhere. So I think now we're moving the discussion to not what can Europe do for the cultural and creative industries, but what can the cultural and creative industries do for Europe? We have 25 million 
children in Europe that live under the line of poverty. And uh, if the creative industry somehow can get the wheels going again and make sure that they're not marginalized, I think that would be an important contribution from the cultural and creative industries to Europe. I never question the intrinsic values of culture. and I don't think any of you guys do that, but they can do more and um, often they also want to do more. ECIA, I promised to mention, I will do that here in this slide. ECIA I was, uh, uh, was started three years ago and uh, in June 2012, I had the privilege of being appointed chairman by the European Commission of ECIA. We presented on the 26th of November this year, 10 policy recommendations on what can you do as a member state or as a local or regional uh, government or the EU when it comes to enhancing the framework conditions for the cultural and creative industries. And I'm welcome to present them to you. Uh, there were 10 policy recommendations grouped in three. Uh, and the first two recommendations were about uh, crossovers. This, how can we make sure that the creative industries contribute to growth, innovation, and competitiveness in the rest of society? We had some tests with innovation vouchers. We had some concrete uh, actions in innovation voucher schemes that were extremely successful. Now the question with ECIA is uh, where will we take it? Will it uh, move from being a project for the few to a pla platform for the many? And hopefully uh, we will see uh, the dust settle uh, this spring or this summer or this year. Uh, of the future, but nonetheless, we have 10 recommendations, and if some of you are policymakers and would like to know more about it, I'll be happy to talk with you and also send you in the right direction. I think it's, uh, you maybe have seen this quote before, but already in 2010 in the competitiveness report of the European Commission, uh, this was stated that the creative industries actually produce a lot of jobs in other sectors. And I think it's a, it's a sig significant uh, that is the European Commission that is driving uh, the process in this case. Uh, it's true that certain member states are very much ahead. Uh, you heard from Creative England that, has, that are doing great works in, in the UK, not just in England. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, but it has been uh, um, significant how the Commission has been and is continually driving uh, this agenda. Why is it that we focus on the cultural and creative industries? And I think it's important to notice that uh, they are very powerful. Uh, they might be weak as entrepreneurs and have a difficulty in growing, but they are very powerful. Apparently, uh, Belgium was started uh, due to a uh, cultural act. Uh, maybe that's not a good example, given the state that Belgium has been in the last couple of years. But also, if you take a look at these two uh, paintings, one is, I hope you know, Cultural, cultivated people that you are is Pete Mondrian, and the other one is a Christian Hornslet, a Danish artist that I doubt many of you know. But uh, I have a simple question for you that I know that your subconscious is going to answer right away before your actual mind will answer it. And my question is: Take a good look at these uh, two uh, paintings. If they were I, if they were airlines, who would you fly with? And it's uh, it's quite obvious that uh, design, staging, aesthetics. Uh, working with all senses is really a way to move uh, customers, to move uh, uh, citizens in, in different directions. So you can actually use the creativity, the creativity of the of, uh, creative companies uh, quite powerful. Also, I will give you some examples of, 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 of some of what we've done uh, in Denmark. We in, uh, when we had the expo in Shanghai. Um, uh, we, of course, uh, had some architects build our pavilion, but it was more powerful, actually, to take The Little Mermaid, a story told by a Danish author, Hans Christian Andersen, that some of you may know. We took, actually, a statue uh, from uh, Copenhagen, took it to, um, uh, to Shanghai, and the pavilion had more visitors than citizens of Denmark. Uh, it had 5.5 million visitors, thanks to placing this simple simple act. I have told Americans that they should have, of course, taken the Liberty Bell that uh, you, you know in, in, that you have in Pennsylvania and had taken that to Shanghai. That would have been a been significant sign. 
I've used this case in the past because it's pretty clear. If you're a rational economic person and you want to go from Copenhagen to Oslo, you would never take the ferry. It's much faster and cheaper to fly or to drive or to take the train or the bus. So why do you do it? You do it because you want to get entertained underway. And uh, actually, the DFDS Seaways that runs uh, the ferries have worked together with one of the biggest concert halls in, in Scandinavia because this concert hall has been good at staging the whole experience for the customers and have actually helped them the ferry on how can you make sure that you create a good experience for the people taking the ferry. So they're taking the ferry for other reasons than getting there. They're taking it because they want to get entertained underway. So they hire DJs and do rappelling down on the side and have chocolate festivals, etc. And this was, again, not something that they could have come up with by themselves, uh, but they had to have the help from, from uh, a cultural actor outside the nightclub and concert hall called Vega with some 300,000 visitors per year. Also, um, the license holder of the grill, um, Weber, it's an American company, but in Denmark, they have, in the Scandinavian region, they have a, a market penetration of 80%, and in the US, they only have 30%. And one of the reasons is that the uh, company that owns the license for the Nordic region has worked together with designers and artists on staging the event of grilling, because in reality, you're not buying a grill. You're buying an experience together with your family and friends. You will stand out there and turn the beef and drink some beer, etc. It's that feeling that you need to sell. So they actually made the largest indoor grilling restaurant where you can come in and grill uh, using the Weber grills. Uh, and so the whole approach that we're not selling things, we're selling a common experience. And here again, it was artists and creatives helping them. Anne Black is a Danish uh, ceramist. She was told when she finished school uh, that she would never be able to live off her craft being a ceramist. Luckily, she teamed up with uh, people uh, that had this uh, business background. Actually, she married a guy who uh, was an economist, and they now end up, uh, have ended up owning a factory with 60 people employed in outside Hanoi in Vietnam where they produce this. The difficulty and the challenge, of course, is that the cost price of a, a black mug is higher than the sales uh, cost of an IKEA mug. So IKEA can actually sell it at a profit uh, at a lower price than Anna Black can actually produce her cups. But it's this, the fact that you can still see the, the works of an artist uh, in the cups will make people uh, buy it. We already had uh, some of the former uh, participants in Create a Business Cup uh, mention um, uh, that they uh, participated in this uh, event and competition that is much more than a competition. 55 countries are participating and using the Create a Business Cup as a tool to drive an agenda nationally. And that's what I also would like for, to invite you to do. And the agenda is the following. Try to build uh, business skills within entrepreneurs in the culture and creative industries and then also team them up with companies. The partnership with companies is important and also give them access to finance. So this link between entrepreneurship and innovation is uh, at first maybe not that obvious, but in reality quite obvious. Many companies today uh, are uh, uh, eliminating their R&D departments because they find more development, more innovation outside their own companies, just like the case of Lego. I was just asked by uh, the Arla uh, dairy uh, producer, it's uh, the sixth largest dairy producer in the world, uh, uh, mainly here in the Nordic region. They asked me, could you ask all 5,000 participants in all five, 55 countries in CBC, um, what's the future of food? What's the future of food, uh, both production and, and, and consumption? And of course I can do that, so we, we ask all these creative minds from around the world to give Arla some good input uh, by November when the actual uh, competition takes place. We had uh, uh, also some excellent cross-sector innovation examples in Creative Business Cup in 2013. It was uh, a Croatian winner, Teddy the Guardian, 
These were textile designers that became extreme users, a term from design thinking, uh, towards engineers, and they produced a teddy bear that when a child is sick, you place next to the child and it will monitor the child's heart rate, oxygen level, and temperature simply by placing this teddy bear next to it. And it was actually some textile designers thinking of that, not uh, the engineers. So when I present this to investors, they say to me, but that's not creative industries, that med tech. And I say, well, does it matter what it is? We don't necessarily need to put it in boxes. We know that it creates value uh, for society. What are some of the dangers here at the end? I think uh, that some of the dangers is that uh, we try to overlook the, or we, we happen to overlook uh, the potential for newness, thinking outside the box for innovation that lies within the culture and creative industries. We need to look for an industrial revolution where one of the driving forces will be the cultural and creative sector. The slide you see here is, or a picture you see is from a Danish um, uh, game called uh, Limbo. It's about a little boy trying to save his younger sister in a, a dark, humid Scandinavian or Nordic uh, forest. And uh, the Danish Ministry of Culture were so, uh, or the Danish Arts Agency and its support programs were so uh, ahead of their times that they were the first ones awarding this uh, uh, computer game um, support because of its artistic values. It has great artistic values, but it also has great commercial value. It ended up being on the top five of Xbox in 2010, I believe. I can't remember the exact date. So just to underline the fact that the fact that something has great artistic uh, cultural value does not necessarily uh, run against the fact that it can also have great commercial potential. So thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, I will be around today, uh, unfortunately not tomorrow, and would love to tell you more about both the uh, ECIA and the uh, 10 policy recommendations and also about uh, the possibility of uh, joining uh, Creative Business Cup. Thank you. Thank you, Rasmus. So, questions? Oh. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I have a bit of a comment and then related question. Um, yesterday I met with some representatives of Samsung in the, in the Baltic states, and uh, they were talking about their business situation in, in Europe, and they told that they have hard times understanding how come in South Korea every, uh, I don't know, inhabitant would have at least two mobile phones and every time a new one, you need a new one because it's a matter of, of status and belonging to society. And how come Europeans don't consume at that rate and extent? And what I thought to myself was that I'm, I'm glad that we don't consume uh, at that extent and to that rate. So what I've been thinking while listening to all presentation is, is what if there's just a major overproduction of little thingy this, a little thingy that? Uh, so is there any document or does European Union think about doing, producing less and rather doing better the things that it already does? Or in investing in, in, in other type of activities rather than you know, producing stuff? Um, very interesting question. Um, first of all, I think the reason why people uh, consume many cultural products, including, I would say, an iPhone is that, or a telephone is that, is because uh, the stories that we tell about ourselves and how we construct our identity is very much around the clothes that we wear, the music that we listen to, the movies that we see, etc. So it's part of our own uh, social construction, uh, the consumption of, uh, of creative uh, products and services. Very much the story that I tell and you tell about who you are. So that explains that. I don't necessarily see uh, what we work with or what we promote in ECIA or with the cultural and creative industries is more products. I think it's uh, more intelligent solutions, solutions to societal problems uh, that uh, uh, artists and creatives can come up with. Uh, it's not necessarily making more cups. 
Uh, I would though say that uh, instead of buying maybe 20 IKEA cups, if you had bought uh, uh, 10 of Anne Black's uh, handcrafted cups, you might not just throw them away, you might keep them, you might treasure them, you might spend more time actually finding the right ones for you. So it's not necessarily a consumer society that we're pro promoting, but uh, intelligent uh, solutions to the challenges that, uh, that the societies are facing. Okay, any more questions? The second question. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just a it's very interesting topic. The, the other question I wanted to ask is, uh, there is a saying in business that uh, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, so if you think about the organizational or corporate effectiveness, um, uh, you can have whatever strategy you want. If the corporate culture <laughs> will not be a fit to drive that kind of strategy, uh, it will not, meaning it's, it's all into waste. So corporations invest a lot of money in, you know, coming up with uh, corporate values in becoming better corporate citizens and uh, in, in internal communication activities and, and team building activities. Do you see there is some role in these very, you know, corporate affairs, affairs that, uh, you know, uh, cultural uh, industries or creative industries can, can, can add to? Yes, if I, if I understand your question correctly, then um, uh, obviously uh, corporates, traditional companies, have a hard time figuring out how to order or how to work with cultural and creative companies. The, the cases I mentioned here show clear results, uh, but it is unusual to do that. Uh, we have a study from Denmark that show that 45% uh, of companies in Denmark believe that it's valuable for business to work with creatives and artists only 5% do it, so there's quite a gap between that, uh, those that do it and those that want to do it. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's also a problem um, among the creatives, uh, broad term here, uh, I know I could be more nuanced if I had more time, uh, to actually be able to present what solutions they have, what can they do for a transportation company like the ferry that in reality is an entertainment company, or what can they do for Lego, or what can they do for Samsung, for example. Uh, often they have an, often uh, cultural and creative companies have been focused on a consumer market. They sell things for the consumer. It's a B2C market. And, I, and, and few of them, maybe the exception being architects and designer, just to be a bit uh, designers, they, uh, they have this B2B approach that they're actually selling a service to other companies and not necessarily to the consumers. So there's definitely both a need for making the industries of Europe aware of the, the potential, but also making the, uh, the, the creatives aware of that maybe it's not more products or more albums or more ceramics, but maybe it's also uh, providing solutions for companies and cities and regions. Uh, you know, we have a problem in Denmark with uh, obesity among youth in certain uh, areas of Copenhagen. Can we somehow uh, stimulate movement and uh, that you're not just watching TV and eating pizzas every evening, you know, is there some way that, that, uh, that, that, that a, a cultural creative product can, can, can uh, work uh, against that uh, sad development? Thank you. If I can follow up, uh, do you think it's a two-way street? Uh, for example, the artists or the creative industries meet uh, the business in, in the middle and they just, the business also has to be in the same mindset that they need some creative thinking in order to change up or add some value to their enterprise? Or is it the artists coming to the enterprise and saying, hey guys, you've been stuck for five years, here's what I can mm. propose? I think it's, um, I, of course it's a two ways, you have to work on several fronts here, there's no easy solution to uh, what needs to be done. I think it also comes to the educational system. If, if you are taught, uh, I even know that certain ar that architects in Denmark, when they, they, when they go through school, they, they are not necessarily taught that they should, that they will have clients, <laughs> that they will actually have to provide something for someone that will order uh, something from them. So definitely also in the educational system, there's uh, things to be done. And I think also uh, many of the organizations that work for the creative need to get out of that mindset. Um, 
in the study I mentioned before, we asked 1,400 creatives in Denmark and compared them to a control group of non-creatives, like dentists and, and pharmacists, and, uh, etc. Uh, and we found that creative people have just as many ambitions about living off what they do. They, have, they are commercially just as driven as, uh, as uh, other sectors. There's not this, uh, I, there is an idea of course, but it's not, it doesn't show re in reality that artists are there just for the, because they have something inside them that needs to get out. Uh, they actually do want to make a living of what they do and what they can. They do want to be heard and sold and seen and experienced. Uh, and I think it's often the organizations around them that need to move outside that uh, old traditional thinking. thinking. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Rasmus is a marathon runner, so I think finding your competitive advantage and uh, seeing that and uh, adding that to your enterprises is uh, very valuable, and it really seems like a marathon that you have to do uh, all uh, night and day long. Uh, but if we uh, go further on, uh, we have some gender balance uh, in this uh, session, finally. Uh, I welcome uh, Nikki Smedley, who's going to talk about the creativity connection, uh, especially about the skills of the artists and how we can use that. Uh, she's the partner and communication guru at Changing Cultures, and I'm sorry, but I have to mention it. <laughs> no, don't mention it, because it comes as a surprise later on. You think? Okay, I'll just say, she has a fantastic TED Talk. If you haven't seen it, uh, check it out during the coffee break or later on uh, during the night. Yeah, I'm going to put a link yeah. um, on the blog page of the Changing Cultures website, along yeah. with any references okay. that I make. Okay, the floor is yours. Uh, 20 minutes, that should... Uh, yeah, um, go ahead. Thanks. Okay, so, hello, yes. Um, this is me, this is my company, and this is my talk. And I'd like to explore with you what the artist's skill set might be. The question is, what makes artists different? I left school at 16 wanting to be an actress, but the drama schools in those days didn't take students until they were 18. So I went and did full-time dance training for a couple of years. I couldn't move forward in the way I'd planned, but I was flexible in more than one way. <laughs> Dancing is hard like all artistic disciplines. They are referred to as disciplines for a reason. They're hard work. They're really easy to give up. You need huge amounts of self-motivation and drive to keep at it. And even if you're really super good, you're going to get the door slammed in your face sometimes because you're just not what whoever it is is looking for on that day. You need to be incredibly persistent and resilient. And then when you do succeed, it's terrifying. Whether you're going to step out onto a stage or be recorded or you're facing a blank canvas or a white piece of paper, there's a huge amount of pressure. So you need to learn very effective stress tolerance. Part of the reason that it's terrifying is that in many art forms there are a lot of people counting on you to do a good job and consistently whether it's your fellow artists or your audience, your clients, your patron, your agent, and it's not just about teamwork, it's about unwavering reliability. And it's exposing. When an artist works, he or she is saying, here is a part of my soul. And that takes courage. It's more than confidence. You can bluff confidence, but you can't bluff courage. I ran my own dance theatre company for over three decades, and I learned on the job how to plan, organise and prioritise. And I thought I was a pretty good producer until I moved into film and television, which is a different level of logistical complexity entirely. Uh, and now I can't stop. I'm almost obsessively organized, which I know is not the cliched stereotype of an artist. And of course, at the heart of all artistic endeavor is communication. It might vary a little bit depending on the art form, but generally, whatever kind of artist you are, you are bothering because of the desire to express something and mostly there needs to be an observer or recipient of that expression. I think the best art makes you feel different from experiencing it. It should shift you in some way. And sometimes that shift can affect the whole society. 
Banksy has produced hugely original, witty and moving pieces of art, but he's also changed the status of graffiti and street art in our entire culture. And no one can deny that as well as being a groundbreaking artist, brand Banksy is a hugely successful business. So then let's just have a look at the business side of things. There are hundreds of lists like this on the web. I'm going to whiz through these. This one's from Forbes. This one is from Business Daily. This one is from Warwick University. And this one is from Kent University, which is itself a collation of some other studies. And this is all those pieces of research and more put into a nice clean list. So where might we find these competencies? I'm sure you realize that a lot of those art forms are interchangeable as examples of them. That top picture is me in my guise as a children's storyteller. And it's interesting, I think, the rise of storytelling in business. More and more organizations seem to be valuing the importance of an agreed and cohesive internal and external narrative in order to succeed in their internal and external communications. And they can see how a spoken artist, a spoken word artist, such as myself, can help them with that. Storytelling is now an acceptable art form in business. I think dance has a long way to go to achieve that, even though we all have bodies. Maybe we don't all have bodies that can do that. <laughs> but the really brilliant thing is that, like the artistic disciplines themselves, these competencies really do get better with practice. My point, obviously, is that what businesses say they need is just what it takes to be successful in the arts. That an artistic intervention can do much to increase the level of ability in any organisation. So what does make artists different? Yes, there needs to be a talent, a technical prowess, but that's the same in non-artistic fields too. There needs to be imagination, perhaps. Imagination, innovation, creativity. Imagination enjoys a strange mystique. People always ask, where do you get your ideas from? And uh, my stock answer is that I have a specially trained elf named Sebastian who lives under my bed and feeds them to me while I'm asleep. And <laughs> John Cleese out of Monty Python used to say that he got his from an estranged aunt in Swindon by second class mail. <laughs> but the truth is, like all of these skills, imagination improves with practice. So what about creativity and how does that relate to growth? These definitions are from Chambers Dictionary. And once again, there seems to be more commonality than there is separation. But where is the business link? Well, of course, creativity goes way beyond the bounds of artistic endeavor. These people have used their creativity in myriad ways, some in the arts and some not but all have been successful, and some have grown some of the most successful businesses we've ever seen. And if any of them are a mystery, there's the names. I speak about the nature and value of creativity a lot. And whilst that's not the main thrust of this talk, it might be just worth having a quick look at this. The creativity uh, equation is one of the models I've used in education and in commerce to help identify and understand some of the components of creative thought and deed, really is a tool to chunk down the abstract notion of creativity. And what I like about it is that I couldn't possibly say this is an absolutely correct analysis. It's not, it's not the analysis, it's just an analysis. So it's a great tool for discussion. It helps people unpick their own opinions around creativity and also to recognize, even if they don't think of themselves necessarily as creative people, they all display and utilize some creative competencies. And they can see areas where, there are where they are strong and where there might be room for improvement. It gives a more tangible focus. Once again, of course, there are echoes of the skills needed in art and business that we identified earlier. So what makes artists different? What worth can they bring in a cultural creative collaboration. And let's just take a moment about collaboration because I think it's a lot harder to do well than, than most people give credit for. It's not just about working on the same project in the same room at the same time. It's more, but it's something that creatives have to become skilled at. It's more than just teamwork. 
imagine the potential disaster and huge expense if you've got a director and a writer, a cameraman, a composer and an actor who can't work together. They have to appreciate and accommodate each other's expertise. As you'll have gathered, we at Changing Cultures like a bit of an equation, so here's one we had a stab at for successful collaboration. And this, this came about from a keynote that my colleague Nicola Richardson were giving on the subject, and we thought we were very well qualified, because the, our first attempt to work together was a bit of a disaster. I was commissioning her to design set and costume for a theatre show I was making, and we just couldn't get it together in the initial stages. We worked it out, of course, and this equation came out of the discussions we had around why we'd failed first time round and what we had to do to turn that round and achieve success. Again, there are some familiar elements, but something new is starting to creep in, and that's honesty and trust. And why would you need to be trustful? Well, of course, because you're taking a risk. And risky is something that artists are really good at. It goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. Here is a piece of my soul is a really risky thing to do. Trying to make your mark or even to make a living as an artist is a pretty risky thing to do. An artist has to befriend uncertainty. Creating something out of nothing is inherently uncertain. And of course the only certainty is that we live in an uncertain world. But business knows that too. And looking back at some of the collaborative examples we've heard about today, they all needed some element of risk-taking in order to succeed. Of course, there's one group in our society who are more at home with risk than most of us. One of my favourite quotes from the genius author and artist Dr Seuss is that adults are obsolete children. And, and let's face it, our brains are firing at the top of their game in our early years of life. It never really gets better than that. But maybe artists' obsolescence isn't quite as complete. It's the same curiosity, the same sense of investigation, the same desire to experiment, to test and to play that feeds the artist, after all, that provide the absolute building blocks of our learning and development as children. And that bond means that some artists have a special knack for communicating with children. I speak child, and it stood me in good stead. I worked at Ragdoll Productions making children's television programmes for many years. Firstly, Teletubbies, I'm the yellow one on the screen. <laughs> and then Booba, Look What I Can Do, and In the Night Garden. Now, Ragdoll had a high street shop, which, despite the success of the TV shows, ran at a loss for decades. The reason being that it didn't primarily exist to sell stuff, it primarily existed as a kind of installation of ragdoll characters, so we could watch children play and interact with them, and thereby learn what was meaningful to them in our shows. And this made our brand hugely successful, and everyone loved our shop, and it was always full. Because the central message wasn't, let's spend, the central message was, let's play. So people came to play, and then they spent. And more importantly, they watched the programmes in their masses. So then we could sell the programmes worldwide, and the programmes became global successes, and we made millions of children smile. And as a byproduct, millions of pounds. And that's all very well in the children's market, you might say, but it also works in the grown-up world. Look at Apple, of course. Is their central message not let's play? Great swathes of social media occupies adult lives, and most of it's playing. And then there's the massive gaming industry. But even though this is true, in some creative and cultural crossovers, there can be a real reticence to play, a reluctance to step out of the comfort zone, can't there? Is it pomposity or laziness, insecurity, fear of looking silly, fear of failure? I mean, we all know that you learn more from failing stuff is true, but it doesn't make it any less scary or the fear any less real unless we're playing and then it doesn't matter but it's the playing we're afraid of <laughs> uh, actually though i think it's quite simple i think an awful lot of us just get out of the habit out of the habit of trying something new experimenting playing taking risks being creative you know all the stuff that leads to all the wonderful innovations and human progress we've heard about and then it's harder to get going again, like going to the gym, but with more smiling. 
So surely, if we have the opportunity to get some of that back through creative or cultural cross crossover, we should seize it with both hands or feet or whatever, because that creativity is going to take us to growth. It's going to grow us, and it's going to grow our businesses. Changing Cultures have a project called Conference Connect. We were frustrated about how most conferences we attended had time set aside for networking, but it didn't seem to ever work quite as well as it might. The people would stick with whoever they came with or the first person they had a cup of coffee with when they arrived. So we invented a process. Luckily, our first conference was for creative industries, so we thought, great, they'll be up to something different. So when they registered online for the conference, we asked them questions about their motivation and their values and their dreams rather than just what do you do. And when they arrived as part of their pack, they were given a place and time to meet a group of people that we had matched for them in advance according to these criteria, so kind of your perfect CCI match. And they also, everybody got a prop, like a red rose or a yellow carnation or rolled up newspaper or a little spotty umbrella or something, so they could recognize each other. <laughs> and um, we also made little installations around the venue of cliched places to meet, like under the town clock or on the park bench or at the railway station, so there was something for them to talk about. And it worked really well. But the biggest surprise was the impact it had on the atmosphere of the whole conference from the word go. It was brilliant, and there was a huge shift in attitude and openness to communicate. Our next one had a kind of sciencey maths theme, and the little installations were experiments. So people had something to do and something to play with that would kind of break the ice and help the conversation flow. And also, on their name badges, there was a little chip inside, and there were readers on the installation. So if two people kind of bipped in their cards, automatically their email details would be exchanged. And so that big circle you see on the back there, that's names of everybody, and you could see the connections being made throughout the conference. Perfect business solution. And then that's me and Nicola doing the chef-themed event. Your <laughs> perfect recipe for success. But, but whatever the theme of the conference, the process seems to work. And it may be because we're creating a more relaxed and playful environment and then modeling that behavior that it takes the edge of people's fear or uncomfortableness. Delegates are given permission to show the playful, creative bit of themselves. Which brings me back to children. I think part of the reason most of us get out of the creative habit as adults, is that it's kind of taken from us. It's gradually discouraged as we grow up. I've seen research from several different EU countries showing a marked drop-off in the creative skill set as children move through education. The very skill set we saw earlier benefits business as well as the arts, and of course hugely benefits the individual. Where does it go, and why? Can we not let our youngsters utilize and grow their own creativity throughout school, encouraging their individual exploration of what interests them as much through secondary school as through primary, in age-appropriate and challenging ways, of course, facilitating their learning, developing their interests, and inspiring their personal growth? It feels to me like a radical change is necessary, as if as a culture, certainly at home, we are behind the curve of our own advances. The social structures are behind the technological leaps. Where are the crossovers for our children and young people, as well as for our businesses and organizations? They're ahead of us in many ways, and we have to learn how to keep up. So what do we do? Well, what we want for, for our children, for our employees, our colleagues, our citizens, for them and from them, is surely what culture, play, and creativity give us. So let's encourage and apply those creative competences. Move like a dancer, listen like a musician, invent like a writer, have the discipline, communication skills, and ability to collaborate of the artist. Practice technique and imagination. Practice play and reliability. Practice experiment and exploration. Practice risk and trust. Teach them in our schools, apply them in our business life, value them in our society. This is the creativity connection. Human creativity is a miraculous thing. 
In many ways, it's all we have, and artists know that, and that's what makes them different. Thank you. Any questions? So exciting. You can speak in. Can I? Yes, just speak. They're really it's, squishy, aren't they? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm disappointed no one has a question. I quite want to throw it. <laughs> you want to throw it yourself? You can do it randomly and then uh, they have to ask the question. Maybe that's the way. <laughs> well, like, that's a bit, that's a bit choose full the of target. pressure. Very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Uh, it's like you can uh, figure out. Find the microphone. <laughs> oh, you're already holding it, so. Ah, um. uh, no, I'm not ready. <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay, Sorry. throw it far away. Okay, who will catch that? Get back. rid of it. Jana? Do you have a question? No? <laughs> okay. So? You won't break it, just throw it. There's a question. Okay. Oh, there are some Here. people. <laughs> okay. Go for you can it. try. Oh, okay. You can try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are squishy. <laughs> That's what you wanted to test? Okay. <laughs> now it's the question time. Question. Yeah, maybe it's time for the question now. Um, <laughs> How do you think we could uh, start project, initiate project, without defining a result? Because one of the, the main questions when we discuss about an idea, we discuss about a project, is what will it be at the end? And uh, presenting a process, presenting an approach, leaving space for this uncertainty, for this experimentation, uh, how could we approach it in that way? That's a good question. Um, I think maybe it's about how you define what that product is. You might not necessarily be working towards something terribly tangible, but I also think you have to know why you're doing a thing. So there must be something that you expect to get out of any project, otherwise you wouldn't bother doing it. So perhaps it's just a shift in how you think about what that product at the end is, or the reason for doing the project. The project. And you might find, and if you build in a, a level of flexibility, and also stress the importance of the process, then maybe that product comes out of the process, or maybe the product ends up being something that you didn't think it was in the first place. Um, I think particularly when I'm working with children, they quite like to know what it's going to be at the end. But they get more value like if, if they know they're going to have, I don't know, a picture of an apple or whatever. But if you change that round into, today we will be exploring apples, and some of them will want a picture, and some of them will want an apple, and some of them will want to make a pie or a, a headdress or whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? So you can just kind of shift it to take in a lot of possibilities. Thank you. Um, yes, hello. Um, it's, uh, I've been uh, listening to many uh, speeches about creativity and reading a lot of stuff about it, but it's the first time that finally somebody says that the first thing to be done to, for a creative society is to start by teaching the children so that they get creative and not teaching them uh, to be creative, but teaching them in a creative way so that they become creative. And uh, it sounds very difficult to implement that in the European uh, very conservative, um, conservatist uh, education system. So I was wondering if you, uh, for example, uh, worked with the policy makers or ministries of education to try to find maybe, maybe not changing the whole system, but maybe there are some quick wins, maybe there are some things that could be easily done to progress towards that? Yes. Um, I don't at home, but I have a little bit um, in Europe. And you're right, it's difficult because pe people, are, people are scared. <laughs> uh, they're scared to let go of that control that teachers and school as a thing have always had over, over the children. And um, 
come and hear my talk on Friday, talk a lot about this. <laughs> the balance shifting and how the balance of the education system needs to shift in order to make the most of our children. Um, and to, 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 to kind of square that, learning experiences these days can be really challenging and really robust, but still involve the child in a real proactive way so that it ends up being a shared exploration. They go away with an investment in what they've done and perhaps don't end up then at 15 playing with their iPads on the bottom, you know, underneath the chemistry shelf. But they need to value themselves and we need to teach them how to do that when they're very young. And then they grow up instantly to be productive, creative human beings. There was one more. <laughs> and it's not oh, yes. Um, now you need to help me in the middle, okay? I throw to you and you throw, okay? Let's see. Let's see how it works, okay? This really works. <laughs> That's back to the past to make a difference. This really works. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. I'm just wondering, because I, I work in, in, uh, live in the UK, so I understand the problems. And if there's a strategy we can come up with creativity by stealth, yeah. risk taking by stealth, because I think the people that will help us make the difference, of course, are the members of government, ministers, policy makers. And I just want to do a plug for Dance UK. We did do a little bit of that um, when we launched our dance manifesto and invited members of parliament to come and join us in a dance class. And we had 23 members of parliament and uh, members of the Lords coming and doing a jive dance class. Now you couldn't have asked them to experience it and that sense of a risk because they stood around the corner very afraid. But once they got into it, they let themselves go and were actually enjoying themselves. So, Let's think of, is there a way we can actually implement a strategy of, of stealth in the risk taking? Yes, I think so. And um, I think we've got a lot of children and young people on our side who would like to see it as well. And I think as soon as you, as soon as you can prevent, present any kind of evidence, whether it's the people who joined in on that occasion or whether you can go, look what happened to this child, that school, this institution, then perhaps people will wake up a little bit more to what's happening, because it's getting very late. <laughs> okay, thank you, Nikki. Thank you very much. <laughs> so now we had, uh, have had uh, three great presentations on business development and growth and uh, crossover. And now, for now, we will have two cases uh, about funding and growth. And the first one is, um, from Doris Frolich, Program Director of Impulse Program from Austria, and he's going to present creative vouchers as innovative tools to facilitate creative crossovers. Oh, Doris, please welcome. Great. Hi. So welcome, good afternoon. My talk's uh, about uh, creative vouchers, or we could also say about uh, the role of public grants as innovation driver and the tool for stimulation of demand. I'm Doris Fröhlich, uh, and I'm working for the Austria Wirtschaftsservice in Vienna in Austria, which is uh, Austria's uh, development pro uh, bank for the businesses in Austria. Uh, you might know we have a very cultural, traditional uh, industry in, in Austria, but also the creative industries are becoming more and more important. Around 10% uh, of the uh, companies are already part of the creative industries and they are developing very dynamically. That's why around 10 years ago, um, several programs dedicated especially to the creative industries has been established. And uh, we started with our Impulse Program Kreativwirtschaft uh, in the areas of music, design and multimedia. Uh, this program aimed at strengthening companies in the creative industries, but also, on the other hand, creating awareness for their uh, innovative power. Uh, the first years showed a clear demand for that, and that's why 2008, uh, an overall policy strategy named Evolve was created, and since then, the Ministry of Economy uh, is, uh, uh, in fa uh, in, is uh, doing that. Our core activities uh, always aim uh, very, uh, very much focus on the uh, creative industries based innovation activities uh, and as we can see from the experience of the last 10 years this innovation very often takes place at such, at such borders, at crossovers through, to cultural industries but even more to traditional industries. 
uh, we've learned very fast that we have to target uh, our customers very clearly. So that's why we support uh, uh, projects in 10 dedicated creative industries areas. You can see them here. It's design, architecture, multimedia, just to name a few of them. We think that only talking about creative industry support is not enough. Um, what we've created so far is an overall uh, concept uh, by offering grants on the, to the creative industries on the one hand uh, and uh, uh, training programs especially for uh, young uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we st we, we, uh, on the other hand, we, we saw that it's necessary to stimulate demand and that's why we've created vouchers like in 2011, a project within the European Creative Industries Alliance called Vinci was established. Uh, there were 20 vouchers of a maximum uh, amount of 5,000 euro uh, in the region of Salzburg played out. The vouchers mainly aimed at boosting the innovation process of small and medium enterprises uh, by integrating creati creative service providers into their innovation projects. Um, so facilitating crossovers between the different sectors. Uh, we received uh, over 70 uh, uh, applications and 20 of them were selected by a jury. One of them was Andata, a company which uh, created a new and innovative approach for intelligent traffic control and they needed uh, um, uh, help in communicating their, their, uh, their work. So therefore they worked together with a web design and multimedia specialist and uh, uh, yeah, together uh, established a new presentation of the project. Another, uh, perfe another perfect example is uh, company Schwingenschlögel. They needed to develop a new semi-trailer, uh, a tank semi-trailer, uh, and together with an industrial designer, a, a unique design for such a semi-trailer was developed. Uh, crossovers between countries were also um, possible. Uh, not only the, the applicant had to be from Salzburg, but the creative service provider could be from everywhere, in Austria or even uh, from other countries. And for example, here, uh, they work to, this uh, Salzburg company worked together with a company from Vienna. Um, we proved that uh, there is a demand for such vouchers, and uh, that's why in 2013, the Ministry of Economy released a budget of 1.5 million euro. And within, yeah, mainly, um, so to say, within three weeks, we got more than 900 applications. That's why the ministry uh, doubled the budget. This time we selected the projects by, on a first-come, first-served basis. Um, this is one example. A small cabinet maker uh, developed a prototype of, type of a biodegradable couch together with a design and uh, material develop, developing company. And that's all, already now a new business branch, a new design series branch in that company. Another example is uh, Motas, which is uh, providing design and architecture, uh, design and products for small places. And uh, they uh, developed together with an architect and designer uh, a new charging station for mobile phones, especially for the use in public places. The logo and the corporate identity can, can easily uh, melt into the uh, station. One example from the digital world is uh, the project Social Recruiting, which uh, is performed by a social media professionalist together with a full service marketing agency and graphics designer and they created a new avatar for innovative job advertisements. Uh, this example is uh, performed by a very old uh, traditional company. This uh, company is nearly 50 years old uh, and working in embroidering techniques and they were working together with a designer that uh, specialized himself on all sort, sort of textiles. In 2014, we made another uh, uh, approach. Uh, we, we, uh, the, the ministry uh, released another 1.5 million euro uh, budget, and uh, this time we tried another process, not a jury process, not a first uh, uh, come, first served process, but a notary um, helped us uh, uh, giving a random order to the project. So very quickly, just uh, an impression on how the uh, Regional crossovers can be, of course, mainly, many of the, of the uh, projects were performed within Austria, but all 2% were from, uh, from the creative service providers came from the surrounding countries and 1% even from uh, far away. So uh, to sum up, I think uh, learn who, who the target audience is very uh, important, who the customers are and what they need. Um, involve regional partners. They have the direct access to the companies and the communities 
and uh, don't underestimate need and necessary amount of communication activities. Thank you, Thanks. Laurie. Did you notice the counter on the slides? What? You have one. What? For yourself. Wait, the <laughs> no. So the counter on the slides, it's a nice skill. Yeah. Thank you, Doris. <laughs> okay, for the next speaker, um, it's going to be Alice from Infogram. And um, it's my personal experience with an Infogram that uh, I saw how they started as a two guys at Tech Hub, and they were hacking something together, and then Alice joined, and basically then it took off. So, it's a woman power. Please welcome Alice. Hi. Can I get the water first? The glass? Hello. Thank you for a lovely introduction. Um, my name is Alice. Uh, I'm a designer. I'm uh, really passionate about technology. I'm really passionate about people and especially how those two interact and how we as a designers can uh, improve this interaction. And uh, I, improve, I, I invest my knowledge on an everyday basis uh, and I build Infogram. And for those who don't know, uh, Infogram is a web tool for infographics creation. It's a web tool for journalists and uh, data storytellers to tell their stories in an in a appealing way. And uh, Infogram is a three-year-old three year company. Uh, it was the, the idea of the tool was born in the news media because the founders of Infogram, uh, they worked at that time in one of the biggest uh, Baltic media company. Um, and Uldis, who was a designer, and uh, Raimonds, who was a developer, they saw the, the problem that um, journalists don't have a time for uh, wrapping their ideas into a visual appealing way and to tell the stories that would be understood really quickly. And uh, then they decided that they should create a tool which will solve this uh, like that. Uh, and uh, basically how the, how the service work, there's a step one, uh, users pick pre-designed uh, templates, then they combine infographics from different uh, chart objects, texts, and, and, and uh, images, and then they, then they publish uh, their ready work into a website, social media, or, or download the infographic. So this, the, the solution was really simple, and uh, it got really uh, appreciated from, from the industry, and uh, that was really encouraging. And there are several, some millions that we're really proud of, and by millions I mean millions of users, millions of infographics created on our service, and uh, millions in terms of funding. Uh, but I will tell about, the uh, about our journey to millions a bit more later. But, uh, ooh, this seems not working. It works, okay. Ooh. So that was the step one that I told previously about. So it's a pre-designed themes that people choose to create infographics. Does it work now? So yes. So the first step of the journey. So we had an idea, we had a team, and if you to take a closer look into how big companies start their work, so or startups, so they have a garage, they have idea, and what's next? The, the next thing we hear about them is that they're Facebook, they're Twitter, and they got bazillion uh, fundings and, and, and users. And when we uh, look closer into what the journey is, so we learn the word startup, uh, and we learn that there is an ecosystem that helps you to grow, that there are people from Facebook, from Twitter, who are happy to share their knowledge. And uh, then, then we, we thought that we should use these paths to uh, get into industry. And uh, another thing that helped us to validate that this problem is, is real is the general situation in the, in the traditional media. And as we all know, like whatever chart or statistics you take a look uh, that represents classical print media, uh, or is it uh, 
print revenue in, in advertising or, 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 uh, uh, or employment rates. They're all going down. And unlike the online media, that is really like it's, it's, it's basically our uh, everyday so, uh, source of information that we're using. And what, what is specific with the online uh, uh, environment is that there's a lot of noise and a lot, of, a lot of information. And if you have some quality message to send to audience, you have to deal and you have to compete with, uh, with uh, entertainment. And there's a one bright and really uh, good like, uh, proof that our idea has a, has a uh, good future is that th this is a chart that represents search volume for two key uh, keywords, search and internet. One is infographics, which is blue line, and uh, another is uh, wall cats, which is a funny cat. So why do we love this chart? Because it uh, represents that quality professionally and beautifully represented information can compete with entertainment. Uh, so when we validated this, uh, we started our journey to industry events, which is startup, uh, startup uh, conferences, uh, accelerators. And uh, the, the first part of the chart is uh, events we didn't we, we were not accepted or we didn't win any pitch competitions but but the really good lesson we learned from these events is that all people in an in, in, in audience or or advisors they they shaped our product the way it is the, the way users see it now but the uh, two uh, bigger logos one is hack forward uh, which is our first um, uh, accelerator that we got accepted uh, it's, it's a Hamburg-based uh, business accelerator, and the Startup Sauna is a, a Helsinki-based uh, accelerator. Um, uh, this is a, uh, this is a, actually a day of when Infogram got launched. It was in February 2012, uh, and that's actually the day when I joined the team. And this is how Infogram looked at that time. Uh, we had few users, we had some page views, we learned the word what grow and growing up means. Uh, it means that you cannot host your service and company with two euro uh, hosting and then we move to bigger uh, hosting services. And um, we've always shared uh, our message or small victories with, with the press, with the, especially with the local one. Uh, and, uh, and, and actually, press is really happy to see these success stories, especially from small companies and, 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 and Latvian ones. And while uh, industry cele celebrates our victories, the professionals still hated us. If you know what uh, bug means in, in computer language, it's a system error. So yeah, one journalist call uh, that we have more bugs than a swamp at Sandown. Uh, but and then there's a, another bad uh, thing that you might run out of the money. And uh, we received a, kind of a Christmas card before Christmas Eve that uh, after three months of due diligence pr process, uh, investors said no. And, uh, and then we took some side projects. Uh, this is a Microsoft uh, app uh, that we thought that we should be doing. And that's another lesson that we learned that uh, you shouldn't go away from your focus and just stay on the initial idea and, and keep doing what you're doing. Uh, but then there were some brighter moments uh, and we, we, we still kept uh, going to these industry events and uh, by this time it was more than 400 events that we attended. And uh, we started to get some success in these. Uh, for example, Informa Information is Beautiful, which is London-based uh, data utilization community, gave us gold price for, uh, for a tool that can create infographics. And uh, then a startup conference, The Next Web, uh, said that we're the best startup in 2013. And uh, all this success kind of uh, uh, ended up in having 1.3 million investment from Berlin-based uh, accelerator, uh, VC, VC agency, and London-based Connect Ventures and uh, Hack Forward. And all this kind of success, small successes and small victories uh, led Infogram to what is today. And it's being used by two million users world worldwide. And uh, among users, there are people from education, not only journalists as we thought initially. There are people from 
and NGO organizations, they're business people and, and, and media and they're still journalists. And uh, they, there are some loud uh, companies that we're really proud of and that they trusted and appreciated our service. And that there's some millions that I mentioned before, there are two millions infographics created. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I could just walk away and say, yes, this is our success story, but when we took a closer look at the quality of first infographics, we had to conclude that we're still somewhere around lolcat quality level, and we had to do something about it. So what we did, uh, we created a social initiative called Infogram Org, uh, which is an initiative that helps to uh, raise data literacy level in, in society. And uh, actually, this is how Infogram team looked like on a map. And the red dots that you see, they're Infogram ambassadors, people who voluntarily joined Infogram team uh, with, the, with this message to, to raise data literacy level uh, and, and in a society. And uh, that's where Infogram is located. One is Riga in San Francisco office, and a Visual Loop is a blog that joined Infogram, also uh, data visualization uh, software. Yes. And this is how Infogram uh, team look like. So the one lesson I can, or one takeaway I would like you to learn from us is that no matter where are you, you can build a global company and, uh, and, and you should be proactive and be everywhere you can be and you have to find your spotlight. So that's what we did. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Alice. Uh, good luck with uh, all the rest uh, for Infogram. Uh, you're really one of the success stories from Latvia, and we're really proud. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just to draw a few conclusions, we really want to thank all the speakers, the keynote speakers and the express presentations. Uh, the session uh, dealt uh, with uh, business and uh, the link to creative uh, entrepreneurship, creativity and crossovers. Uh, we started talking from economic and culture language, then we went on to partnerships, uh, then the creative skills, uh, that was fantastic, and then we had to uh, these express presentations, so uh, thank you all. Uh, I just want to remind you there are three exhibitions that you can uh, watch while you're sipping your coffee. Uh, there's the IT Demo Center behind also, almost uh, the registration stand. Uh, it's very fun uh, to play around in. Uh, then there's a giraffe, a virtual reality glasses that you could put on and see what's uh, new there. And then uh, when we walk to the restaurant, there's this design manifesto that uh, uh, basically creates the story of Latvia and says what we're proud of. There are a lot of uh, good things that, so you can uh, read about that. Uh, we have the coffee break, uh, but to take Nikki's ad, uh, advice, uh, I want to, we don't have anything planned, but uh, if you would uh, be able to, uh, while you're drinking your coffee, to talk about your visions or childhood dreams and find even one person that you have uh, like-minded ideas, uh, I think that would be a gain for you during this coffee break. Uh, 20 minutes and shall we return at 4.40? Thank you so much.